And the other point that you get out of a robot is consistency. But that's that's the other challenge. And on both sides of the world. The funny story is always when I, on the cleaning sites, ask the headquarters is that how much time do they, will you, do you clean in the store? I, a different answer than when I ask the school manager, when I ask the guy that cleans the floor. Hello and welcome back to the Retail Podcast. Now this, like quite a few of my interviews, has been an interview in the making for a while. I've been trying to get on Michelle's uh, diary um, and, and it's been chaos for both of us being in different parts of the world. But I'm lucky enough to be joined by Michelle Sprout. Uh, I'm, I'm, hopefully I, I did some justice to your name. Uh, if, a mark out of 10 maybe for the pronunciation, is it? I would give it a seven and a half. I'll take the seven and a half. But uh, Michelle is the president of BrainCorp. And I saw BrainCorp um, earlier this year at Eurosys, where I got some time to, to spend with your, actually your engineer. I think he was your chief growth officer there. And it was really fascinating to look at how robotics, inventory management, and all the different elements are coming into play but before we get into all of that why don't we michelle just spend a few minutes on you how how you're, you're the president of brain corp international tell us a little bit about yourself tell us a little bit about what brain corp does i know retail is just one of your verticals um in terms of all the verticals yourself but yeah i'd lo love to hear more about you yeah thank you alex uh, for having me of course uh, it's always a joy to uh to join you on these things. So originally I started off with uh, wanting to work in the printing industry a long time ago. I did it, I did it for five years. And then I went into uh, IT accessory uh, manufacturing and, and selling. Um, I've done it for 20 years in a lot of different roles. And uh, one day I had a, I got a phone call from Brain saying, hey, we want to expand outside of the, uh, the US uh, and we want to start a European uh, office. Are you interested in uh, starting that up and leading that? So it took me uh, probably a couple of weeks to think about it because it's a big decision after 20 years. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, it was very exciting to enter a world of AI, software, robotics, what I was never exposed to. Yeah. And I thought that I could learn a lot from it because I like to learn from the things that I do. So... I made a decision to resign uh, my uh, current role at that time and start BrainCorp uh, in uh, July 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's, uh, so we're already five years in and uh, I still enjoy every single day. It's a um, very dynamic, very fast uh, growing industry. Um, when I look back, you know, time has been flown by um, really crazy but it also brought a lot of insights into the different ways of people think about robotics and ai and software and uh, certainly in the beginning uh, i always was asked you know don't you think that these robots take all these jobs yeah and in the beginning there was i always said you know ai is about uh, embracing so you can do two things you can run away for it <laughs> yeah. You know, until it bites you in the back and then you're too late or embrace it and see what it can do for you and work um, it from that perspective. And I think there, and that's also the reason I went working for Brain is I wanted to embrace it and see how it can work for people and not against people. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the evolution of robotics uh, it, specifically within retail, has been really interesting for me. A bit slower than I imagined, if I if I'm honest. I I, I am considering how long the capability has been there. But then I, I remember, you know, talking about um, again with your engineers how software is is as important now because everything it just becomes a connected mesh. But again, I, I would sort of take it within. Um, specific segments just going back to in terms of the company tell me a little bit more about brain Corp. so it's a us-based organization right san diego right yeah so it was, our headquarters is based in san diego and it all started uh, back in 2009 when uh, using uh, 
uh, Eugene Zekovic, our founder, uh, worked at Qualcomm and uh, he was leading the department within Qualcomm that was uh, responsible for AI robotics and uh, in a consultative way to Qualcomm. And um, in 2014, he wanted to make his own uh, story. Yeah, me. He believed in a better, safer, more productive environment with the whole, with the help of AI. So what happened is, is he left Qualcomm with... Uh, I think seven engineers, uh, PhDs, and they have been thinking about, so where can we add value with software brains? Yeah. Because uh, Eugene is a neuroscientist. Sure, how, can we, how can we do that in a way that it really helps people? And so we came to the conclusion that cleaning was a great uh, point for us to start. And, then, and that took us basically in the, from 14 to 24, where we are now, into this whole space of retail because in retail obviously there's a lot of cleaning and um, we have a lot of retailers that uh, decided that with robotics they can challenge the labor shortage absenteeism and all these things and they also can make sure that these tasks are done every single day so we we came from that perspective and obviously um, having been sold a lot of robots into retail if you look at our total robot count, we have over 37,000 robots out in the field. Wow. Um, and a big portion, certainly, of the bigger machines are in retail. We really took that and also listened to the retailers what kind of challenges they face. So next to cleaning, we also do this whole sense, we call it, a piece of the puzzle where we help retailers to get a better view of their environment and their shells and their products and how they can use that to basically maximize their their store environment yeah i got you well one of the things um which when i in my old corporate world i used to always ask the cios or execs that i met one question what's more important to you to make money for your board or to save money for your board as in people's approach to the problem are they doing it for uh, gain or, or efficiency just looking at your different use cases from store cleaning to inventory optimization what what, what do people turn up to ask your help for yes yeah, so it depends on which angle you take so if you look more at, on the cleaning side cleaning is something that needs to be done and it needs to happen every single day. I think I can share. So this is the one I saw in action. Yeah, but that's that's the big machine. And that's so this machine you normally don't see in stores. This is a okay. machine that you normally see in DCs and warehouses because it's 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 a it's a at the end of the day it's a volume game. Got you. Plus, it's also about uh, how big is your store and what can fit your store because that's the other challenge. Because this one probably can drive an aisle and then we're done. And then you need to place, but these are, this is a very nice uh, industrial logistic DC solution. Yeah. That we see going in a lot, uh, to be honest. So sorry, I, I interrupted you as you were talking when I said, what's more important to save money or make money? Cause I see yeah. them as two, but you were saying it depends on the use case that the customer comes to you with. Yeah. So if you take the retail, uh, the, the cleaning site, yeah. Talk about the cleaning side. It's something that needs to be done every single day. So it's a it's something that is a cost that they want to perform every single day. Yeah. While if you are talking about the sense, so this is the the thing that you show now on the screen. Yeah, this is the one. It's about the gain. So what are the challenges that you face? Are you facing out of stocks? Are you facing theft? Are you facing your phantom inventory? Um do you want to optimize your on shelf availability. If we talk about that, that's all about the, the game side of the world. So it depends on who you talk to, because the, on the cleaning side, different people are responsible than on the the, the sense side. It's yeah. Uh, other time, it's on the sense side. It's more the CIO, uh, some oper store operations, while on the clean side is more the facility facilities. So. It really depends on where you go with what. So we always see in reality that we talk to their two different groups Good. with their own kind of interest where um, the on the cleaning side, we talk about, you know, labor shortage, absenteeism, 
uh, learning curve, rotation of jobs, yeah, and finding people. On the sense side, we're talking about consistency, about every uh, on certain moments in time. So I want to do it twice a day at certain points. So I always have the same measurements over time to really look into what are my challenges on the shelf. Yeah. So it really depends on who you talk to, Alex. And uh, I think that's, um, in a way, a very nice thing because we, we, we have a very broad scope into retail and we talk to everybody. So we hear a lot uh, of the challenges that people face in retail. But I'm just curious, what are people coming to you What's the problem that they're coming to you right now to solve? Which, which, which one is it more in? Which camp is it more in? I think today the, the, the cleaning challenge is the bigger challenge because of labor shortage. The, the sense side is something that everybody is interested in. But they're very early, it's very early in the curve because there is so much going on in retail world uh, right now. And there is so much software out there. So... It's also a matter of where are your priorities? Yeah. Where do you think you can have your biggest gain in the short amount of time? But we, but everybody, and that's, and that's the nice thing about having uh, multiple solutions is that when we go to a cleaning show, it's really focused on the cleaning side. Yeah. And even if I bring uh, the sense sites there, it's, it's not of their interest. If we go to a more retail show, where retailers are coming that are looking for technology to, for the game. Yeah. Then definitely the sense solution is a real solution they all want to talk about. So there is not a shortage of talk about it, but it's all about the strategic decision that you're willing to make to implement automation and robotics for the best use in your retail environment. And I think, and I see that people struggle with that one the most. Making that strategic decision to not say, you know, I'm go, I will, I will go for one and then I will see for a longer time how it works out. No, really looking at, so what's the problem we are trying to solve and we're going to solve it at scale. I think there is the, we have still right now, that's, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing. I'm curious, the sort of legacy way of trying like out of stock, I've seen companies like Walmart go heavy on using robots to do inventory management for out of stock. Does that, is that like, is out of stock one of the key areas that you see from inventory management? Is that like one of the gains that you get with, with Sense and, and using your types of solutions? I think there are multiple things uh, there, Alex, is that out of stock is a, obviously a big thing, but it also depends on your infrastructure and your supply chain. If out of stock is your biggest gain or at least the gain, because if you don't, stock inventory in your back room you can find out of stocks but you cannot refill the shelves yeah and at the end of the day it's all about making sure that the, the right product is at the right moment at the shelf at the moment your customer wants to buy it and if you don't have it and certainly if you talk about branded products where people are looking for and i don't want to mention brands because we, we need to be careful of course always with brands but if i want to have a certain brand and i go to store and i cannot find it yeah I will not buy a substitute. I will go to another store. Yeah. And then you get, again, so what's the loyalty of the customer to go into store? Is if I find less than 50% of the products in your store what I need, I will go to another store where I can find more than 50%. Yeah. So it's also making sure that your customer stays loyal and keeps on coming to your store. So out of stock is definitely a, a high rating one. Yeah. Uh, the other one uh, that's combined also with the other stock is that um, if you listen to retailers, what, of, what is one of their biggest problem is theft. So theft, uh, damaged goods, and phantom inventory. And I, what I mean with phantom inventory is you buy uh, a Sprite and a, and a Fanta or Coca-Cola. You scan two Sprites. So the system thinks you, there are two Sprites gone, but in reality, there is different product gone. Yeah, well, you can do a lot with the data of sales in and sales out. Yeah, but theft and damage uh, goods and uh, phantom inventory will mess that up. So it will also not give you the right uh, angle of what you need to do. Yeah. So so that's one piece of the puzzle that you can say okay, but you can also look at so price tech compliance is the price that is on the shelf 
is that the price that the product really needs to be? Got you. Or if you have uh, electronic price labels, electronic price labels, they change color based on inventory availability. Again, sales in, sales out. But if you work with theft and all these things, it will mean that your price text display the wrong information. So it's, I think it's all these things together and are creating the solution for the customer. Because I don't think that it's a one trick pony. Every retailer faces some kind of the same problems that they have their own priorities and in their mind things to fix it. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to listen to their problems and come up with a solution, but do not listen to their solutions because that might not be the right solution. Yeah. So, so th that is evolving our product, uh, and not only in retail and, and in outside retail, but that's really the driver for us is that what's the customer's problem and what are we trying to do to help them with it? And sometimes it's not the right thing right now, but it might be in the future. So we always keep a lot of close contact to, to the retailers in Europe and international to make sure that we not only today, but also over time can provide them with the solutions they need. And we're, we're but we are still at a very early stage of adoption, certainly in retail, because also retail is uh, very traditional and that's, that's not a good or a bad thing, but that's just the reality. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it takes a long time for them to take the right decisions on going for that strategic decision to scale. I yeah. think that, but I, but I also see that retailers really want to make that decision, but they need help. So I think we're now at the stage where retailers are willing to listen and see how, how we can help them. And hopefully in the next year or two, we will get to the point where automation is not a, a question, it's a given. Yeah. From the given, we explore other things to, to optimize it even more than it is today. Is the robotics side still a barrier? Are people still, have we moved on from our uh, robots, I don't know, going into people or the, the, the physicality of having robots? Have people moved on for that? Or is that still a concern from them, for, for them? No, I, I think we have overcome that. I think if you talk five years ago, definitely it was a thing yeah. that something was driving around autonomously in a store. What we see more now, it's become, it's become, became more a gimmick. So every, we see a lot of people starting filming the robots because they think it's cool that it's running around. The only thing is, is sometimes people don't understand what they're doing. So what you see is some retailers have put on a scrubber and said, I'm cleaning for you. Uh, they put on the, on the, on the scanners, they would put, uh, we would put, uh, I'm a, I'm a scanning robot, not a price checking robot for your product. Because they're coming up with your products. And I think that's the, the whole thing, Alex, is that all these things you can use for multiple things. Because if you look at the, the, the sense side of it, the scanner side of the world, retailers are changing their planogram, you know, every week, every two weeks, every week, there are coming new products. Every week, their uh, products are gone. You want to make sure that, uh, the brands that matter are at the right spot in your store because you know that they care. Uh, they want proof of performance. So you can combine a lot of things there in the store, which you can go from out of stock price, tech compliance, uh, plan account compliance, but it all depends on how are you willing to invest in it? And are you willing to, you don't need to adopt, but you need to change my, maybe sometimes some processes. Are you willing to also look into your processes? Because that's what we see a lot of times in the process, both on the cleaning and on the send side. Yeah. That that there is not a real process that somebody does something, but it's not a process where you say, when I come in in the morning, these are the things that I do. I want to have before eight o'clock, I want to have cleaned the fresh aisle, the, the, the high density aisles at eight o'clock when my store opens, I will clean the frozen food and the alcohol because normally the people in the morning that come in at eight don't go at that section. So really giving it a thought. And it doesn't mean that you need to change the way you work or that you change uh, everything in the store. No, it's about creating a program on what you want to do and what you want to get out of it. If we if we just put ourselves in the in the in the in the shoes of someone who's looking at robotics for their store, I'm coming to meet with you. 
What's the thing that I'm not probably thought about? What's the one thing that you're always having to educate people on? So the first thing people always think that it's very complicated. And that one of the things that we did is we made it very, very simple. Because if people think about robots, it's always like, oh, I, d I don't understand that. And then we say no. Um, and I always say, Alex, I can teach you in 30 seconds how our robot works. Yeah. We have spent a lot of time on making things easy, both on the robot and off the robot. Yeah. We work with an app where a lot of the information that you need to know is in the app. Yeah. So our goal has always been to work together with people, not to replace people. That's why with our technology, you always need a person. It's not sometimes not to operate the robot, but follow up on the actions that are coming out of the robot. Got you. There's always a human in the loop somewhere in the process. Yeah. It's also sometimes the challenge that there is a human in the loop because you need to make sure that they do the things they need to do. Yeah. But that's the same challenge that you have today. AI today is not a product, it's a feature. And so therefore, this isn't about taking people's jobs. It's about allowing them to go faster, to get more data, to get the outcome faster than they would do if they were going to do it themselves. And I see you're not there to re replace my job necessarily, but to help me do maybe four things rather than just one uh, and get to wherever I needed to get to faster. Yeah, that's one point. And the other point um, that you get out of a robot is consistency. Because that's, that's the other challenge. Because... You and on both sides of the world. So if you with a cleaning machine, if you can clean on a consistent speed, yeah, you will get a different result than when you are sitting on it. You're driving faster, slower, getting off to it because you need to pick something up, go sit again, and and it's the same on the other on the other side is because if you know that if every single day at that six o'clock and at one o'clock your inventory is scanned and it's all always scanned in the same way, you always get in the same way your data, yeah. You know what's going on, and I. And, and the funny story is always when I, on the cleaning sites, ask the headquarters, "Is that how much time do they do? You, do you clean in the store?" Yeah, a different answer than when I ask the store manager. When I ask the guy that cleans the floor, because what I get is like it depends on the priority. If we have an empty store, somebody might take an hour and a half of cleaning the environment. But if the store is busy and he has something else to do, he can do the same in 30 minutes. Hmm. But it means that clean is not the same clean in 30 minutes as one and a half hours. So that is also part of the role. The robot will always do his consistent way of working yeah. in the way that you want to do it. So you know always the output. And if the output is not there, we have the ways to track it and to see why not and to optimize it in a way that next time it can be optimized in the way that you want it to be. How, how long does one robot traditionally last? Like, what, if, what's my investment in this? If, if I'm investing in these solutions, when do I have to, what am I budgeting for? What's the period? Right now, if you see people are buying the robots or working with the robots for five to seven years minimum. Got you. The thing is, and that's, um, is because the robots, you know, if you put a robot next to a manual machine yeah and you look at the the way it looks you almost can based on uh, feeling the robot you can see or feeling the machines which one is the robot and which one is not because that's the other thing is that uh, with the manual machine there's a lot of damage on the machine because they you run into shells and end caps and doors while the robot is avoiding that yeah so and as you are running the robot way more uh, consistently, the, tear, the wear and tear is also way more uh, spread over time. I got you. So, so in general, we see five to seven years. Looking to the future now in terms of where you see this growing and the, and the pace of adoption, change, and transformation. As I said, how do you see the future? What do you... What are the big things that are on the radar for you guys that you think will have a, a big impact? Uh, we, we still believe that the whole sense part of it will be a big portion. I think AI will play, will play a bigger role for future. Yeah. Uh, also in regards to uh, self-checkouts, 
uh, theft prevention, where you will have more recognizable things, where you RFID will hopefully at a certain moment in time affordable for everything. So you not only can see things, but also count things on everything. Yeah. There are companies obviously in apparel that just do RFID where it's easier to, to count, but um, I think in the future, pricing will go down to so. I think there will be a lot of features that will help to make things easier. Yeah. You? Because right now, if you need to do a, let's call it an inventorization of what do you have in store, you really need to have a lot of people counting things. And I think those are the things that we will see towards the future where there will be a lot of added value where you can, um, I will, again, not replace, but in coordination with people, get way more consistent output on a more regular basis yeah. than it is today because inventory is done now every quarter or maybe. But imagine that you could do it every day. Uh, I'm just curious on the inventory part because we've, we've discussed this. Are there any sort of live data points or anything that you've seen that surprised you from the, I can't, 30,000 robots that you've got out there? Is there any data that's coming back that has pleasantly surprised you or surprised your customers? Because you mentioned complexity was one. It's not that complicated, right? That that sort of like for them was was yeah. right, I think. The, 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 so what's interesting for us is that um, the more robots you have, the more data you have. Yeah. And the more data you have, the more edge cases you have. Yeah. And uh, the more edge cases you can solve, the better your robots will become. <laughs> So, um, and that's the nice thing about when you ha are facing an edge case. If you solve that case for that one robot, yeah. if all our software, all our robots are on the same software. Yeah. If you solve it for one robot, you solve it for all robots. No um... So next time when you see your robot that has not faced that before, it will just handle it in a way that you thought, hmm, interesting. And I think that's, I don't think it's a data thing. But I'm always, and with me also customers, surprised about how robots get out of situations you were not expecting they come out to. Got you. So do you think, you know, this is impossible for the robot to do? And then we, when you look at it, it is always finding a way to do it. And I think that is, for me, always a big thing. But it's the same thing from going from manual to automation. When we teach a a cleaner that becomes an operator, a robot operator when they, they start with a robot. When they start using the robot, there's always, in the beginning, there's always some hesitance. Yeah. But when they see the robot run for the first time, what they teach the robot, they always start to smile. And in the beginning- You can't help. When I saw it, you can't help but smile. Oh, you can tell them. <laughs> but then always ask for some adoption. So yeah. Yeah, what you see is that in the beginning, they are fearing it a little bit. And after two weeks when we go back, they say, I want them to never take it away anymore because I see the value. Yeah. And they see, start seeing the value if instead of doing all this, you go sweep the floor, you go clean the floor, you go... Right now, what you can do is, is you sweep an aisle, the robot will take the aisle, you go to the next aisle. And one of a sudden, when you're in the middle, you can help unloading the trucks. You can help... Uh, um, put stuff on the uh, products on the shelves, but you can also help customers. So there will be more customer attention that way. Yeah. So it solves a lot of different things and it uh, also adds a lot of additional value you didn't have before. I got you. Is there one question that you are normally asked that I didn't ask? Yeah. Uh, I, th I, think th I think we talked about it, but th it's more about um, the thing that I always would like to end with. Okay. Um, it it's It's... Two things. Well, one, again, is AI is there to embrace, not to run away for. Yeah. You always should look at what it can do for you. Um, and you can come to the conclusion that it's not for you today, but be prepared for the future. That's one. The yeah. second thing is when you talk about robotics, be able to be willing to strategically decide to implement robotics at scale. Because at scale, you will see all the benefits that it's bringing. One robot or two robots is, is also good, 
but it will not bring you the skilled advantage that you are looking for. So one, embrace it. Two, if you embrace it and you see that it works, make the strategic decision. And it doesn't mean that you need to say, I will do 500 today. Yeah. But make for yourself, say, I will, I will start with five, then I will go in three months to 10, and then I will roll it out. So you can also take your learning curve in it. But that way you can really maximize your investment in robotics and AI. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for giving up your time to be with, with us this morning. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you at one of the future conferences. You will definitely see that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Alex.